morning. Good to see you guys and gals. I get distracted by the keyboardist each week. You all know that. That's my wife over there, and I just kind of just stare over there for a minute, just have a little private moment. So just wanted to make that as awkward as possible for each one of us today. <laughs> so there we were. We were driving through each security checkpoint, and things got better and better. And as we got further and further advanced on this Air Force base, I, you could tell something serious was happening. There was definitely a VIP on base. And we started getting more and more checkpoints and, and getting closer and closer. And finally, the people who had brought me said, you get a chance to be in the room to hear the second most powerful man on the planet. I was like, wow, that's cool. I was 17, 18, maybe. I was just getting old enough to be able to vote in the next election, okay? And our choices that year were kind of, eh, you know. But it was still exciting because when a sitting vice president comes to your town and you get an invitation to come hear him, you go. I mean, who comes to Huntsville, Alabama? Right? That's just like the little, speaking of Alabama, God bless America, roll tide. Just wanted to say that. And we're, oh, come on now. We're going to open the altar early. So we were sitting there, and they say, walk up to these double doors, and here is this huge hangar. And the, the bay doors open, and there, stand, surrounded by Secret Service, is the current vice president. And I was just like, that's him. That's the guy I've seen on TV. I mean, he's right. He's short, but that's him. He's right there. And I look back at the people, and they said, go, go, go talk to him. I'm like, I can't talk to him. I said, what do I do? And they said, just go try to shake his hand. So I was, and I just started walking towards him. And then the Secret Service saw me, and they tackled me. I'm just kidding. They didn't tackle me. They parted. And there's a few other people around him, and the vice president turned, and he looked my way. And I was like, is this happening? Is this really going to happen? And I extended my hand, and he looked at I kid you not. He looked at me, and he reached out his hand. And it was as if the clouds parted. The sun shone down. In this moment, time stopped. A sparrow landed on my shoulder and sang a hymn. And I reach out my hand, and he grabs it. And he shakes my hand. And I'm, I didn't want to turn loose. I was like, this, I will never wash this hand again. <laughs> And I haven't. It's a little funky, but I have, it's right here. And I was so in awe. My eyes were full of wonder. I turned around, and I look at the people who brought me. And they're like, yeah, you're the man, man. Go, Josh. It's awesome. And I was just like, I was just like, I was floating for days. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe I had. Have you had an experience like that? Where you can look, and you, you were just so wide, I would wonder that you kind of just look like this. You just, you just had that beautiful gasp where just, you're just so in awe. I hope you do. If not, you can reclaim it today. In fact, we have a photo. April, do we still have that photo of what I looked like when I had hair right after I shook his hand? There it is, right there. And I just kind of had that look for a week, and I walked around. When was the last time you had that wide-eyed awe, that sense of wonder? Was it over a person? Was it over God? See, what we're going to look at today with David in Psalm 139 is when he was awestruck. He was blown away by God's goodness. So to get us thinking today about wonder, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put some images up on the big screen, and if you recognize them, don't think, just shout them out, okay? Just shout out what you see. The first one's a gimme. It's easy because it's actually written there for you, and I'm going to give you a hint. They all have something to do with wonder, all right? So if you're ready, here's the first one. Shout it out. What you got here? Wonder bread. Awesome. See how easy that was? Who's ever had wonder bread? Oh, God bless you. I am told it has the exact same ingredients as white Elmer's glue. True story on that. As you think about superheroes, who's this next one? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Nice. Okay, everybody gets that. Let's try you a little, little bit harder. Let's go old school. What about this one right here? Wonder Twins. Who got that? Nice. Bonus point if you can tell me the name of the Wonder Twins, their first names. Xanadin. You go, Eric. You can tell there's a youth minister in the house. All right. Let's keep it old school. What about this one? Anybody know this one? Wonder Years. Thomas has got it. Okay. All right. Let's go one for the little scudders, okay? The little ones in the house. What about this one right here? Wonder Pets. Yes, yes. I thought I was past this, but it's coming back, y'all. Have a one-year-old. And no discussion of wonder would be complete without the last, but certainly. Stevie Wonder, you got to have the legend, the king of R&B. All right, so you're warmed up. You are ready to get lost in wonder. Before we read the passage, it's important to establish context. 
Context is key, so we don't take things out of context and eisegesis what we want. We got to look at the exegesis of this and really see what was going on in that moment. When we look at psalms, do we even know what that word means? I mean, what is a psalm? If you're curious, the Hebrew word is tehillim, okay? It's a very simple word. All it means is praises, tehillim. So you look at your Bible, you see psalms, you go, Pastor, that doesn't look anything. Tehillim, how do I get to psalms? That's because we get the word psalms from the Greek word psalmos. You know what psalmos means? It means song. This is their early hymnal. They're singing songs of praises. And there's 150 of these that we've canonized. And most scholars say that David is associated with 72, maybe 73 of these. This one stands out because this is the one where David does this. And he says, oh, Lord, I had no idea. You are so vast. You are unsearchable. And he is wide-eyed with wonder. So now that you've got the text, go ahead and pull up Psalm 139 on your favorite Bible app or open your Bibles. Let me welcome our online campus, too, while you turn there. We're going to start with the first three, maybe four verses, and then we'll explore more as we go. All right? Follow along with me. It says this. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you have known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You comprehend my path, my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Wow. You can see his awe already starting as he's trying to grasp the goodness of God. This is one of my all-time favorite psalms because all 24 verses have to do with David being filled with wonder. And as you see here, you're going to see he's, he's noticing God is limitless. His omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, it is all there laid out for us in this beautiful, beautiful, almost like a, like a chart. O.S. Hawkins has a great book on this called Jesus Code. And he goes through it and he says, notice the first four verses. They deal with God's omniscience, verses 1 through 6. And then he goes on, and the next few verses deal with God's omnipresence. And then he goes a little bit further, and he changes gears again, and he goes and he looks at God's omnipotence. And then he does something weird. He doesn't look at God anymore. He reveals a very vulnerable part, and he goes to his own obedience, and he talks about in verses 19 through 24 what he's inviting God to do. And that's going to be our challenge today. So if you have kids, or you've ever been around kids, you will notice right away they have a sense of wonder, almost a natural curiosity that borderlines on annoying, because their main question is, why? How come, Daddy? I get that all the time. Why? How come? Because Mom said so. That's good enough, right? Why? How come? They have this natural inquisitiveness, and it's a beautiful thing until it gets out of control, but something happens when we turn into adults. We start getting so jaded and so complacent, and everything needs to be defined in this box where we're like, okay, if I don't have a clinical scientific definition, blah, 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 and we're out. And we don't, we don't have that zeal and that passion. Shame on us. What is wrong with us? When we stop and we look at the vastness and the incredibleness of God, David never lost his wonder, even in his valleys. He is expressing genuine, heartfelt, mind-blowingness. He says, God, you are everywhere. You know everything. You are all powerful. Get this, okay? No matter how well David knew God, as a man after his heart, he never lost his sense of wonder. And that's our first lesson, church. Write it down. Never lose the wonder of the Lord's omniscience. This is key to maintaining your passion for serving God, for loving others. This big word, omniscience, don't let it throw you. It just means God knows everything. Five times we just read in that opening psalm, that David said God knew him. Five times, just in the first four verses. Oh, Lord, you search me. You know me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You know all my ways. There's not a word even on my tongue, but you know it before I speak it. When we read a phrase like my sitting down and my rising up, we think, well, I don't know. What does that mean? Are we just doing the, the, what is that? Is that a dance? And he says, this is a common Old Testament term. It's a phrase that literally means you are acquainted with every day of my normal, boring, daily routine. You know everything about me. You know when I come, you know when I go, you know when I sit down, you know when I stand up. And David is saying, whether he's resting or everywhere, God knows every detail of his life. And then he says, you even understand my thoughts from afar. And he's overwhelmed. He's trying to put God in a box because that's what makes us feel comfortable. But God is not able to be put in a box. And he's overwhelmed by the size of the scope of God's everywhereness. So let me ask, what about you? Be honest. You can be safe, right? This potter's hand, safe. You can take your mask off. 
It's okay to go, ooh, that's kind of a challenge. When was the last time we were truly in awe of God's omniscience, the fact that he knows everything? What exactly does he know, Pastor? What are you talking about? Well, he knows what you do. He knows what you think. He knows where you go. He knows what you say. He knows what you post. We're going to come back to that. He, he knows what you need. David is trying to grasp this incredible extent of God's knowledge, and he becomes overwhelmed. When is the last time we were even remotely overwhelmed by the vastness of God? And it's not just an Old Testament thing. It's, oh, that died out. No, 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 no. Check out the New Testament. Look at what Paul says. Paul has this beautiful, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. This is an amazing God. And he grasps it. And I can't believe there's so many people who just are almost treating God like a buddy from out of town. We pat him on the back. Good to see you. I'll talk to you later. And there's even preachers who are almost content to be like tour guides sitting in the boat, just be bopping along. If you look to your left, you'll see God is great. If you look to your right, you'll see he's omniscient. And no! Shame on us. We, we got to be the ones that dive down into the depths of the sea and grab like handfuls of muck from the bottom and come up with seaweed on our shoulders. We say, this is who God is. Isn't he awesome? And we lose our sense of awe, and we wonder why the world doesn't want to be like us, because we're like, just like them. God's called us to be separate, to say, y'all, we're one beggar telling another beggar, we found food, it's free, y'all come in, but he changed my life, and there's a level of holiness that we got to see, and David has plumbed these depths, and he's been there. This is amazing, because when you think about it, God knows the number of hairs on your head. It's easier for some than others, and he knows your social security number. He'll never send you the spam. He knows your email. He knows your Facebook wall. He sees it. I've been meaning to talk to some of you about that. In fact, by the way, just, just so you know, uh, I was on Facebook the other day, and, and I saw this shirt. This is what I'm getting some of you for Christmas here. Santa has seen your Facebook pictures. This year, you're getting modest clothes and a Bible for Christmas, okay? So I just wanted to let that know. I'm talking to you, Pat Lancaster and uh, Ryan Wisham. Santa may not be omniscient, okay? But God is. God is omniscient. He knows your worries and your hurts and your fears and your struggles and your pain and your joy and your victories, your triumphs. He knows it all, and he loves you. Sometimes even in spite of ourselves. Y'all remember when you were first in love? Oh, man. When I met this girl, I was like, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. And I just kind of danced around. True story. If some of you knew me back then, you know. And it was just this, this wide-eyed one. I couldn't wait to see her again. We would stay at church. I don't know why. Stay at church. And we would throw the football in the parking lot until 3 a.m. Throw the fo- How romantic is that? And we do because we didn't want to go home. We were so in love. And when we got married, I remember we got to buy our first house. And we were so excited because everything was new. The house was empty. So we got to go buy everything for the first time, like from Goodwill. And we were so excited. We went and bought a used fridge. And we brought it in, and we're like, look at this fridge. You can, like, open it and close it. And there's, like, a light in here, baby. There's, look at this. You can close it. It's still on. It's still on. It's still, it went out. And, then, and this one down here, it's still on. It's still on. It's th- this, is, this is good. You can put all kinds of drinks in here. Diet Coke, talking. And you could do all kinds of things. And it was just this amazing thing. And then we said, we need a comforter set. We have to have a matching one. So it was new, and we went and we bought the matching comforter set with the 18 pillows that came with it back in the early 90s with that long sausage-looking thing that we still don't know what that's for, right? You just throw it on the ground. Everything was new. New toilet plunger. This is awesome. We were so excited. Why? Because we were wide-eyed with wonder because everything was new, and we couldn't wait to have mom and dad come up. Oh, we got to show off our our new 1,100-square-foot mega mansion. Mom and dad come up, and they did. And they took a picture. Before I put it up, I just want to give you permission. This is our very first house. I have no idea what we are wearing in this picture. Uh, evidently, we were going through our, our Amish phase. <laughs> and this is just one. It's okay to laugh. We laugh every time. Pat, can you zoom in on that, April? Is that, there it is. That's awesome. We were so excited. Mom and dad take this picture. It almost looks like I'm holding an invisible pitchfork. Does it not? Is it? Is it oh, Awesome. There it is. So we were so excited. And we had this, this moment where we gave them the tour. 
and the, the house was empty, okay? I'm going somewhere really powerful with this, trust me. We're walking through, the house is pretty much empty, and mom's going with Amy, and she's showing them the, the, all kinds of stuff on that side of the house, and we're going over here with dad. And we walk into the master bedroom. I said, dad, right here. I said, check this out. Here's what I'm thinking. Master bed right here. Long dresser here, chest of drawers here. We'll put the big TV, big tube TV, heavy thing back then. We'll put it up there and hope it doesn't fall. And he goes, nope, nope, no, no. It's my house, Dad. What are you talking about? Well, you can't put your TV there or it's going to be going off and on all the time. And you can't put your bed there because you have no overhead light because you have the popcorn ceiling, which is awesome. And you can't even see when you come in unless you turn on this light switch, which is controlling the lamp that should go over there. That's where your nightstand goes. What are you talking? How do you know that? I, hang on. I'm going to get a lamp. I go and unbox a lamp. Come run in. I plug it in. I look at my dad. I just can't wait to prove him wrong. And he goes, flip, and the lamp comes on on the other side of the room. I was so wide. I was, what witchcraft is this? And I look at him. I said, how do you know that? He goes, son, contractors identify which one. They put the socket upside down. So you know exactly this. I'm like, you are amazing. He was so impressive. I thought he was omniscient. Then we go sit down. We have dinner. We cook him dinner. My favorite thing. White meat chicken, white mashed potatoes, and peas. And we're sitting there. Amy's awesome. She cooks a great meal. And we're eating. And Dad goes, oh, sweet. Thank you so much. You like canned peas. And I said, how do you know this? How can you tell these are canned? And he said, son, it's obvious. They're can Look at the color. They're dark green. They're, they're mushy. They're squid. They're good. Don't get But fresh peas are like bright green. I'm like, are they? I didn't know. And see, he was, I felt like Dr. Strange in the movie where he's like being taught. And finally, he just goes, teach me, Jedi master. You are so wise. I thought he was omniscient. And I looked up to him. Okay, now, now remember this. So many times we lose our sense of wonder and omniscience. We do it with people, but what about God? We can't lose it. We're dealing with the creator of all matter, the one who is truly omniscient. Don't miss that. The next lesson David shows us as you read further is never lose the wonder of the Lord's omnipresence. This is awesome. Write this down. This is the biggest thing. This big word simply means God is everywhere. All right, now David is trying to plumb the depths of God's everywhereness, and he does things like this by asking questions. God, where can I go from your spirit? And first he tries the heights, and then he goes and he tries the depths, and he discovers, whoa, God's there. He says, if I ascend to the heavens, behold, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you're there. You're everywhere. He tries east, west, night, day, darkness. Nothing can hide him. Your Bible may say Sheol. Don't miss this. This is a hidden gem right here in plain sight, okay? Sheol most often is translated as the grave or death or place of the dead or hell. And sadly, most times they just translate it gently as hell. And they just make it a very generic thing. But in this specific location, he's actually referring to the grave, okay? The place of the dead. Not the eternal lake of fire burning. Not the eternal residence of, of all the, the, the bad and the wicked and the false prophet and the, all that stuff. He is saying, don't miss this. David is saying... I grasp it, God. You are everywhere. Even death can't separate the believer from your presence. Wow. Even death, we slip through that barrier. God's right there. He occupies past, present, and future at the same time. No matter where we go, no matter where we are, no matter what kind of day you are having, God is amazing. He is there, and he's totally accessible wherever his children go. Think about that. Jonah forgot that. Jonah tried to run and hide from God. He tried to flee him to no avail. Adam and Eve had it all. They sinned in the garden. Guess what they tried to do? They tried to hide. Adam, where are you? Oh, no. They tried to hide from God. And we've been hiding and running and blaming the devil ever since. Don't believe me? Let's bring this into modern day terms. How many of you own pets? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're going to love this. Think, think, think about this. There is nowhere you can hide. And when you come home and your pets have done something wrong, you can tell it immediately. You know why? Yeah, there might be utter destruction as you walk in, but if there's not, you can see this look. The dog doesn't come in and you go, mm, so, Coco, where are you, Coco? And here comes Coco around the corner. He can't even look you in the eye, right? And he starts, he looks up, and he looks down, he looks up, and he starts shaking his tail like he's, we're happy. Everything's good. Everything's good. Right? Right? This is not just about dogs, by the way. Picture with you and the Lord. Is everything good? 
We're, we're okay. You're not going to... No, everything's not good. Coco, you have sinned. <laughs> you have done... You, you, you want to see... Here's a picture. Take a look. This is, this is what Coco... Thank God you're home. Someone broke in and ate your rotisserie chicken again. Look at these two faces. Notice, we do the same thing, y'all. We blame everybody else. Someone broke... I didn't do it. He, the devil made me do it, Right? We can't hide, just like your pets can't hide from you, we can't hide from God in his everywhereness. Look at this next one, I love this. I'm sleeping on this pillow, everything's going great, and then poof, it exploded. Notice the reaction. Look at the, look at the misplacement. Pay no attention to the explosion around me, owner, master. Let's just be grateful I wasn't hurt, right? You, do you see this? We are doing this to this day. Just like your pets can't hide from you, we can't hide from God's omnipresence. And David was blown away by this. The fact that his presence was everywhere brought him comfort and hope. And I hope it does to you. You can't outrun God's love. And maybe somebody just needed to hear that one little nugget today. There's nowhere you can hide in this big old world that you are away from your Lord. And the last lesson from David is this. Never lose the wonder of the Lord's omnipotence. Woo! This is my favorite one. This last big word simply means God is all-powerful. He is. He's all-powerful. Now, here's what I love. David could have described the awesomeness of God by pointing out the galaxies and the cosmos and the constellations. They knew them back then. He could have pointed out all these things and said, look what God's majesty and splendor displayed on the canvas of the night sky. And look up and look at that, because that's what I would have done. I would have pointed out, look how huge and strong God is. But David does something surprising. He goes the other way completely, 100%. And David does the unthinkable. He goes microscopic. Think about this. He goes to this beautiful gift of conception and life. Read with me. Look at these verses here, verse 13 through 16. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was even born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Can you hear his wonder? Think about this wonder of wonders. David is describing two microscopic pieces of protoplasm before there were microscopes. Don't miss this. He's talking about... God's intricate detail of DNA and, and a nervous system and cells and a digestive system and a respiratory system and a circulatory system and a spinal column and a mind and a heart and a soul. What a testimony to the incredible omnipotence of a loving God who literally formed you by hand and knit you together in the mother's womb. This is incredible. So in these verses, David has just laid out the foundation for every single human's self-worth right there. Never, never, never believe the lie that you are an accident. You have a purpose, and God made you, and you have a plan. And he is showing us, David is blown, but his mind is just absolutely struggling to grasp this. And what he does is it's almost like he paints this picture for us, and then I just can't help but go look at the cosmos and be reminded that the same God who made all of this made every cell in your body knit you together, and it's holding together with the cell adhesion molecules like Louis Giglio talks about when we looked at laminin. Man, oh, that's mind-blowing. If that doesn't make your, your wonder and your eyes pop open, what will? Think about this. God knew each one of us before we were born. Knew how much hair we would have or not have. Knew how much weight we would gain and lose and gain and lose. And gain. Knew how much your heart would be broken when you come this close to winning the national championship. I'm not bitter. These are the things that we got to remember. God, he is, we are so loved by our Heavenly Father that apparently, according to David, he thinks of us all the time. In fact, according to this, he thinks of us at all times. What other God says that? What other faith claim has that? Think about this. The exclusivity of what Jesus did even in this moment, he thinks of you, and he's crazy about you. And I think sometimes we forget the simple truth like that. And then David goes on. After he's looked at his omnipotence and, and this incredible conception of a child, he praises his creator with a simple phrase. He says, I just praise you 
I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he does something totally unexpected. David ends the psalm on a note of vulnerability that is so rare. It's so refreshing, really, we should emulate this. Read it with me. Here's his obedience prayer. He says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Your Bible may say, try me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. What a beautiful prayer. This is David's humble obedience on full display. Wow. Can you pray that prayer? See, once we catch a glimpse of God's omnipotence, we should be humble before him and say, Lord, I'm going to echo what David said. I invite you to search me. I invite you to try me, to know me, know all of my thoughts, and then lead me in the path everlasting. You all know I grew up in a NASA household. And uh, great respect for my dad, his gigantic cranium and his intellect. And he was one of the highest ranking execs in NASA uh, of, of all time, and certainly at that time. And he had the privilege of working on the Apollo and then the Gemini and Skylab and, and Saturn program, and you name it. And then he was invited to help launch the shuttle program. And he stayed with it for 30 years and actually was asked to retire it, to stay working long enough to help shut it down. And through this whole thing, they were just living in Titusville. And Amy and I got married. We moved away. We came to visit them one time. And it was one of the last times the shuttle was going to ever launch. And we're sitting there, and he says, hey, you guys, would you have any interest in maybe wanting to go see one of the final shuttle launches? Oh, and it's going to be a night launch. I think I can get you kind of close. I was like, wow, a night launch, the final launch. I don't know. Yes, absolutely, I'll go, of course. When is it? It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. Go get your power nap. I'll wake you up. We'll drive. Take about, you know, half hour or so to get there. I said, okay, sweet. So we get there. We start driving past checkpoint, past another checkpoint. There's cars lined up everywhere. They're on the bridges. People are out. They're, like, waving. I mean, it's like OJ. People are like, woo, they're cheering, having an awesome time. And then as we get closer, I notice the crowd start getting slimmer. We start going through this other thing. Dad's flashing a badge, and we get to go straight on through. Flash another badge, another checkpoint. And the security seems unusually high. And we're going through all these checkpoints, and I'm like, wow, how close are we getting, Dad? He goes, we're not even there yet. We get to this final thing. He pulls over and says, hop out, grab your blanket. We sit down, man, there's like nobody around us, just a handful of people. And as we sit down, I see to my left a convoy of black limousines and SUVs. And they look really out of place. And I said, what's that? And he said, that is the first lady and the entire U.S. women's soccer team. They had just won, apparently, whatever it is they win, Super Bowl or something. And they had flown down on Air Force One and got to be in the bunker next to us. Okay, that's how close we're. And I look over and to my right are these gigantic, like, fire trucks on steroids. The, the wheels were bigger than me. And they were rumbling. They were still going. And beside it was like, this looked like a, an EMS or an ambulance or something. And I said, what are those? And dad said, don't ask. I said, okay, now I really want to know, dad, what are those? And he said, those we call the oh no trucks. I said, are you, are you telling me that? And he says, if something goes wrong with that launch, this is who is sent to rescue them. Dad, we're that close. There's nobody closer. He says, you can't get closer. You want to see how close we got? Here's a picture of the nighttime launch. We were so close. If you get any further, you could actually start feeling heat. No one was legally allowed to get closer. You want to talk about wonder? My eyes, like, wait till I tell you about the launch. We looked at that clock that you see all over TV, and it counted down, and it held at five, and it held at two minutes, and then it's down to ten, nine, eight. Your hair standing up, and it's just like it's going to happen. And then you hear go for ignition launch, and you see the spark fly, and then whoosh, it happens. And like an instant, flame starts to rumble and hit you in the gut, and you start to shump, just, just shudder, and your car alarm starts to go off, and things are going, and suddenly it's daytime, like instantly daytime. The birds that were asleep, like, what? What's going on? And it's just so out of the, it's like what we have with the eclipse in reverse times 10, okay? And we're like, whoa, it's 2 a.m. and now it's 2 p.m., broad daytime. And then it goes and you can see the, the flicker and the flames and the crackle and stuff. Y'all, I was in such awe, such wonder, it was blowing my mind. 
But it wasn't always like that for me. Catch this. I grew up around this. I was around it all the time. As a child in Titusville, I could walk out the back door and see another rocket launch. I'd wave, ah, ah, that's nice, and I'd go back inside. I even got invited to go down and stand under the shadow of the wings of Columbia and Challenger and discover, I mean, it was incredible. Stuff that people would give anything to do, I totally had no sense of wonder. It didn't mean anything to me. I was around it all the time. In fact, I have a rare photo of me and my two brothers and my mom standing under the shuttle. That's how, that's how intimate we were with this. It was so commonplace to us. My dad's the one taking the picture. Before we show it, I want you to notice my demeanor in this photo. I'm going somewhere with this, y'all. Buckle up. I'll be the guy on the far left. You ready? Notice my posture. Tion, you may need to go blackout on this just to let people be able to see this. This is me right here with my hands in my pockets. <laughs> Couldn't care less. It had grown so commonplace to me, I had lost my sense of wonder. I was around it all the time. I had access to it anytime. And because of that, I had let it grow stale. Oh, you see where this is headed? Church, we have access to the creator of life. We are literally standing in the shadow of his wings. We have his word all the time at our disposal. We can talk with him anytime. We can meet at church any day, and I think we take it for granted. Can you imagine? All this at our fingertips, and we just go, eh. We've lost our wonder. We don't look like that giant slow loris that I put up at the beginning with those huge eyes. Can I ask you a favor? Don't be that guy. Don't be like me. Man, we could be so much better than that. We serve an awesome God. Maybe today we just want to spend a moment and pray and ask, God, would you rekindle those flames in my life and, and recharge me? Let it flicker up like that shuttle plume of flame that just turned night into day. And, and God, would you help me never lose that sense of wonder? Because as believers, that's our prayer. This is our challenge today. Never lose your sense of wonder. We serve a God who didn't just make all matter. He made everything that matters. And the lost world is looking to you and to me to be a radiant reflection of this. His omniscience, his majesty, his power. So many times I think we just yawn. So today, here's my challenge. I want us to pray the simple prayer of David that says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Test my anxious thoughts. See if there be any errant way in me. Restore me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Can I pray for you? Let's bow together. God, I thank you that you have revealed yourself, not only through your word, but through your spirit. Forgive us, Lord. Begin with me for the times that we waltz into your presence so haphazardly that we've lost our awe, our respect, our wonder for you. God, forgive us for not being the example to a lost and dying world that needs to see you are awesome. You are full of majesty and awe. God, I pray that you would rekindle those flames. God, begin with us. Don't begin out there, Lord. Begin with us. Begin with your church. Call us to holiness. God, help us to be like David, to return to that first love. May we make you proud and pleased by the attitudes of a heart, the meditations we have. Lord, we love you. Help us to serve you this week. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.